Testament this morning is found in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And I hope that uh, we will make it into into verse 7. I don't know if we will. This is probably one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. And it's not the kind that you want to go through too quickly. So uh, we will take our time, but uh, hopefully... Uh, We will find our way through the chapter in due time, and it will, um, my prayer is is that it will have as much relevance today uh, as it had back when it was written. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. I think one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in contemplating the human condition was when I was 19. I was in uh, Poland to teach English as a second language on a mission trip. And one of the days we had off, we were close enough to uh, Auschwitz. And so as a group, we went over to um, take a tour of the, the death camp that had been liberated close to 50 years earlier. It was a quiet place. Um, It was a humbling place. And when you're in a place like that, it makes you wonder uh, about how man's inhumanity against his fellow man could ever get to such a point. And I didn't know uh, German, uh, but we were walking under a gate and I think I, there's a picture of the gate uh, on a slide. And uh, the picture, this isn't the picture we took, but this is a picture of the gate that we walked under. But the message of the gate is that work will set you free. And it was perhaps uh, the biggest lie that was ever told when you think about it in the 20th century. That for those who were enslaved and sent to that camp, It wouldn't be their work that would set them free. And when you think about the origin of evil and human suffering, where did it come from? How did it get to be so bad to where it is now? You have to ask yourself the question about um, really the beginning, the true beginning, the true origin of things. And as uh, a people who are committed to God's word, we understand that origin to be right here. And when we contemplate, I think, the suffering that has taken place in the human race, and we, uh, we contemplate suffering on a scale like that, we must not say to ourselves, well, it's all really a result uh, of some kind of material process, some kind of environmental thing. Even suffering on that level is something that's almost, in a sense, worldly and yet otherworldly. When two worlds collide, the world of evil, the world of humanity, and you see those two worlds collide here when we um, read the scripture about the fall of mankind. And so this morning, what I want us to do, um, at least for the next few minutes, is to think through together the fall of mankind, because that is what this chapter is describing. It's what theologians and Christians call it. But really, if you are... Uh, someone who is not necessarily um, 
uh, acquainted with Christianity, the fall of mankind is a word that's used a lot, but the idea is that there was an innocent and a lofty height in the communion that Adam and Eve had with God. But through their disobedience to God's commands, they, if you like, in a spiritual sense, infected the rest of the human race through that disobedience with what we call sin. And that sin, if you like, is now infused into the spiritual bloodstream of all of us. And it's led to not only an alienation from ourselves and God, but it's an alienation from ourselves with each other and even an alienation from ourselves with the earth. And so this morning, if you think about it in terms of origin, the origin is right here where we see the first sin committed by Adam and Eve as a result of their temptation by the serpent in the garden. And so the way I want to look at it this morning is really just in two pieces. One, the setup for the lie that they are, to be, that they are going to believe when it comes to what Satan is going to convince them. And then, really, the swallowing of that lie and the awful circumstances that take place as a result of believing the lie. And really, when you think about it, when we've been in chapter 2, the lie is very, very simple. <clears throat> the lie basically goes like this. That there is something outside of the command of God. There's something outside the command of God that is liberating, and you need to find it. There is something outside of the command of God, and it is liberating, and you must find it. And that is, this, uh, that is the lie that the devil wants not only Adam and Eve to believe, but for you to believe as well. And what you see in verse 7 are the shameful consequences of believing and following through and swallowing that lie. So we're going to look at the setup for the lie by the devil himself, and then also the swallowing of the lie and the shame that follows. First of all, the setup. Look at the first couple of verses here. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. I just look at the, first of all, the serpent. The serpent. The, it, this, this is going to strike people right away, who are, again, who are unacquainted with the Bible. They, it will start to kind of mess with their minds. And maybe the question becomes right away, you know, are you telling me that the origin of evil comes at the behest of a talking snake? And just think about it, okay? Put on, put on your glasses from someone that you sit across from in class, that you work next to, that you live among. Maybe it's the person on the other side of the dinner table. And you're explaining the origin of evil, and you're going back to Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, and they, and they look at you, and they say, you're telling me, that this all has its beginning in a garden with a talking snake? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And if you start to think about it, maybe you ask them the question, what kind of car insurance do you have? And they say, Geico. Why? Well, I saw a commercial once. It was of a talking lizard with a British accent who convinced you that you could save 15% on your car insurance? Is it out of the realm of possibility that a, a lizard that w talks with a British accent could save you 15% on your car insurance? I'm telling you, you swallowed that lie. Or maybe you believe in a duck that says Affleck, and you decided that your life insurance was going to be won over by a duck that does yoga. Or maybe you went to the movies and you watched Zootopia. And talking animals taught you that you ought not to be prejudiced. Now think about it. If that is within the realm of possibility for people today, if those ideas already exist in our popular culture, why would it be so out of the realm of the possibility? That Satan himself, who is a masquerader, who can take on the look of an angel of light, could not also take on the look of a snake, a serpent. He's called serpent in other places in Scripture. And present an argument to Adam and Eve, a, a deceptive, twisted, perverse argument that he knows is right up their alley when it comes to temptation. 
He is a masquerader. He can take on different forms. He is a deceiver. He continues to deceive people today. Famous line, one of the most famous from Kevin Spacey in the movie The Usual Suspect, the biggest lie the the devil ever told was convincing people he did not exist. You heard it in Hollywood first. Think about it. The biggest lie the devil ever told was convincing people he did not exist. You see, there, there are two ways to look at this. You can say, but there's not two ways, but there are two ways people look at it. On the one hand, people can say, hey, look, I don't believe this at all. I, I, think, I think the origin of evil has a lot to do with my material synapses, chemicals in the brain, conditioning, environment, and, and such. And there's another group of people, so, some may be here in this church, that are way too obsessed with the devil. They, they believe he's under every rock, behind every tree. He attacks in traffic. He, he's everywhere. And this is, this is like this unhealthy, too much credit obsession with the devil. And if you like, you know, both are kind of polar extremes to stay away from. What we need to remember is the devil, as we read through in, in chapter 3, is the adversary and he is a foe of God. He will attack God, but he's a defeated foe. But we must take his influence seriously. And we need to avoid, I think, those two unhealthy poles. C.S. Lewis, Screw Tape Letter, says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to believe in their one is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to d- believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The devil and his angels are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Think about it. There's something we need to take seriously about the entrance of the devil into our human experience. But we need not obsess to the point where we give him every single bit of credit for every wrong thing that is done. Because in so doing, perhaps we absolve ourselves from the responsibility that we bear of swallowing the lies that he tells. And so he's a masquerader, he's a deceiver, he's an adversary. As an adversary, he is always on the attack, attacking God and his word. He immediately begins by diminishing God, making a subtle differentiation in his name, verse 2. Verse 1. He said to the woman, did God actually say? That's interesting. Chapter 2, he was referred to as the Lord God. Remember what we said before? Capital L-O-R-D is the covenant name. That is the Lord, the relational God who is in and among you, who is in the dirt, forming man and woman. He's with you and for you. G-O-D, that designation for God, Elohim, transcendent creator if you like, other than you. The devil chooses to use the term God as if he is a distant God, away from you, not the one who is next to you, that you will rely on and be dependent upon when you're tempted. He he immediately begins by diminishing him, using a title of transcendence. He begins attacking God by introducing doubt about him through his crafty questions. Did this distant God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The answer is no. He never said that. He said you can eat of any tree except for one. But here Satan is starting to paint a portrait of God who is both distant and restrictive. You see, this is how the devil starts to attack. Everything you knew about God, he is going to twist. He's going to start perversely changing in as he makes a presentation of God that he wants to undercut. He is both distant and he's restrictive. Sinclair Ferguson in his book, The Whole Christ, says, the lie is an assault on God's generosity and character. Neither his character nor his words are to be trusted. God is not to be believed because he is restrictive. We'll get to the woman's response in just a minute, but let's just stay with the words of the serpent here. He is setting up the lie now by preying on Not only the doubt about God's generosity, not only about his character, but now on their own ambition. He says, for God knows, for God knows 
that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, what the devil is saying here is that God really doesn't have your best interest in mind, Eve. See, he knows that there's something much better for you, but he's not giving it to you. What that better thing is, is outside of his command. You want it, and you can have it. For God knows that when your eyes will be, are open, you will be like him. He doesn't want that. But I know you want that. And so he sets up the lie now by preying on the temptation to pursue an ambitious agenda. But it's really woven through a viewpoint of God who is distant and restrictive and wants to keep good things from you. And he lays a burden on you by making you follow those commands. And so people the world over have bought into this lie that God is distant and restrictive and his commands are a burden. And that the only way forward in life is to liberate yourself and find it all out for yourself. And so here, now the trap is set. Remember, knowing good and evil is really about wisdom. It's about being wise in your own eyes. And d the devil sets this trap up now. It's time for a choice to be made. Are they going to be wise in their own eyes as it concerns the command of God? Are they going to view God as somewhat distant and restrictive and while on their own seeking something that will liberate them apart from his gracious command, apart from the promise that he gave? The, the, the trap is set up for all of us when we start to unmask the schemes of the devil. Depending on how you grew up, it's tempting to believe that God is distant and restrictive and doesn't have your, bus, your best in mind when he gives you his commands. It's so easy to think that. He is distant. He is restrictive. It's not about my goodwill. It's, a, it's about something else. He's got some other interest in mind. And it's joyless. And I know he's just up there to get me as soon as I get it wrong. That's the exact kind of portrait of God the devil wants you to have. That's the kind of portrait that he starts to paint for Eve. His commands are a burden. I, ne I need to liberate myself. I need to become wise in my own eyes. I want to decide what I do with sex. I want to decide what I do with my money. I want to decide what I do with my mouth. I want to decide what I do with my anger, my pity, my resentment. I decide. And frankly, if someone crosses me, I will decide if they were worthy of my forgiveness. I will live the life that I want to live. I will do it my way. And you see the disastrous consequences that follow. The lie that is set by the devil is very, it, 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 it's, 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 um, there is something outside of God's command. And if, if you seek it, it will liberate you. But actually, it's a trap. Because as you think you become more wise in your own eyes, the, the greater the enslavement becomes to yourself. And the further distant that you think God is, the further confusing it gets when you try to make sense of a world that is now seeking wisdom according to itself. There's no way out. I'll never forget sitting with a man in his backyard as he was trying to argue with me that his mistress was what God had intended for him because God was for his happiness. And I, I remember this vividly because we were sitting next to a pool and I really wanted to throw him in the pool in Christian love. Um, I really did. Because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Someone who had grown up in a church had convinced themselves, had convinced themselves that God was there for his happiness and that before we were going to tell everything to his spouse who was in the other room, 
but he was first going to try and convince me that really that was the better plan. We're not going for it. Because it's not about your happiness. It's not about your liberation from the value made as if that is the key to your happiness. It's about a promise, a public declaration that you made before God and witnesses. And you're in a tough moment. You've created a mess. But it's time to live and make it through the mess. And you see how the devil, you see how our twisted logic can start to work. It's so easy. Well, isn't there something beyond the command of God? Isn't there something else? There must be. This marriage is too restrictive. These obligations, too burdensome. There's got to be something else. And I think I found it. Now, all I want is for everybody to come along with me. Why isn't anybody coming with me? Why am I hiding everything I'm doing? It's found in verse 7. It's called shame. It's what happens when the lie is exposed. And so here, the lie is set up by the devil. And don't ever think that this could not be you. Even to the worst of, the t- of these moments, don't think for a second, don't think for a second that somehow you couldn't fall in the trap because you can. We all can. I can, you can. God in his grace has preserved many of us through perhaps some of the worst decisions we could ever make thereby releasing us from taking any credit at all for perhaps the good standing that we have today. But maybe you've fallen in the trap. There's, there is hope here as we read Genesis 2 and 3. And I, I want to think through that hope with you this morning. When you look at Genesis 2 and 3, what, what you notice, what you see in God, is someone of unmatched favor who we said the the last couple of weeks has created a veritable playground for Adam and Eve. An unbelievable place of worship for them to enjoy everything. Verse 16 of chapter 2, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, every last one of them. There is one tree that we do not want you to take from. The relationship is set up in terms of loving, obedient, dependent trust. That's the way this relationship is going to work. The grace, here it is, and then the command. That pattern follows through the scriptures. When the Israelites are rescued from Egypt, when they're miraculously delivered by God's gracious and powerful hand, that comes first. Then the Ten Commandments. The people are not saved by the law. They're saved for the law. They are saved by God's grace in order to bask in it and honor and be a distinctive people who love him so much that they want to emulate him and imitate him by keeping his commands. And that continues to follow through to Jesus The grace law order finds its amen in the coming of Jesus. For he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? Here it is. He did. And we weren't even asking. And he gave it anyway by grace. Because the Lord knows we will swallow the lie. Work will set you free. In a spiritual sense, we have eaten that. And yet God has come to give us a sinless Savior, Jesus in the flesh. That the Son is the only one who can set us free. And if we are made free by Him, we are free indeed. By grace, the Son comes. And after we come to the realization through His death that we are immersed in a bath 
a shower of grace. Then in thanks that we might say to God, yes, I would be happy to follow your command because I am convinced that you have nothing but my best interest in mind when you've given me your word. I see it all the way through. But if I look at God as distant and restrictive and a stern policeman, I'm never going to look at him that way. And that is the unfortunate consequence of religious systems, secular systems, the, the worst of ugly conservative systems in the church. It, just, it happens. But you have to go back to Genesis 2 and 3 and look at the order of how God has graciously given them, ev- given them everything for their delight and has given them Also, the parameters of a relationship built on a friendship of trust. But it's easy, it's easy to believe the lie. And so the man and woman swallow the lie. In the New Testament, Eve is is seen as the one who is deceived. But Adam, who is ultimately attributed with the sin of disobedience that infects the entirety of the human race. Notice Eve here tracks with the devil as she mimics him. He begins to call her God. She calls him God. Instead of repeating God's words back carefully, she begins to add and subtract. She subtracts every, when talking about the fruit of the trees in the garden, she starts to add by placing a restriction. Again, mimicking the restrictiveness that the devil had started to sow in her mind as the way to look at God. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said that. But it's easy to begin to add to God's word. She adds a restriction. Maybe she's freestyling. Maybe she's going down the garden path. Maybe she's starting to add this kind of thing to God because now she's listening. And the temptation proves to be too much in her mind when it comes to nourishment, beauty, and wisdom. Look, in and of themselves, nourishment, beauty, and wisdom are good things given to us by God. But when the good things become the only things, then it becomes a disastrous thing. And for the woman, that's exactly what happened. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. You see, nourishment, beauty, and wisdom, food, appearance, beautiful things in creation, intellect, these are gifts that are given to us by God. But it's easy to start prioritizing them as the only thing. And this is what happens in the story of Adam and Eve. It becomes too enticing. It becomes the only thing. While Eve was deceived, Adam eats without hesitation. You know, there's a lot of ink spilled, by the way, about Adam. Where was Adam? What was he doing during this entire time? Now, why is it that in the New Testament, in places like Romans 5, 12, where it's Adam who ultimately gets the blame, but most of the story and the setup and even the beginning is done by the woman? Is that some sort of, uh, is that some, some, some sort of misguided patriarchal what, whatever? I don't know. We'll take the scriptures, what it says at face value, but it is interesting When the serpent is addressing Eve, the you all the way through in verses 1 through 5 is in plural. You all. And then it says in verse 6, she took but fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Who was with her? Presumably the entire time. But not saying a word. The keeper of the garden. With the, with the single most, the, the single most 
disastrous consequence staring them in the face says nothing. Zero. There it is. And yes, there is a deception on the part of Eve. There is a thought process. And what do you get from the man? He just took it and ate it. That's it. Case closed. It, it, it amazes me. It, Eve is deceived. Adam puts up absolutely zero fight. He just eats. If he's there, he swallows everything. He eats with eyes wide open. She takes of the fruit and eats and swallows the lie of whole. He sees she doesn't die. He does the same thing. Case closed. That's it. Game over. It, it's, it, it's an unbelievable account when you start to think through um, the promise of consequence and the perhaps unbelievably short-sightedness of the man and the woman. They live for many, many more years, but death happens in the spot for them. Their eyes were open. They were naked. They were full of shame. The result of shame really is the embarrassment of being exposed for what you really are. It's about knowing that you're not presentable. We've all felt it. We've all at some level known what shame is. Some of us deal with it profoundly because of perhaps choices made or choices made that directly have impacted us. We all know shame. It results when an allegiance with God is somewhere broken and an allegiance to self or something else other than God is made. They both know in that moment that something is wrong. And there is a shame-breaking power that only God can provide. When you read a story like this, in verse 7, the point to be made in verse 7 is not necessarily, well, where did they get the leaves to make the loincloths? That's not the point. We don't really know. The point is, is that when the shame now is for everyone to see, is there a shame breaker who is going to come and reverse this terrible consequence? That's the point. Is this it? The answer is yes, that God will come and break the shame. That when Jesus was in his own garden contemplating the worst pain he would ever have for you, pass the test. Live the life. Faced up against the temptation and resisted the devil for years. And broke your shame cycle by going to the cross and having it nailed to his wounds having it put on his head, receiving the insult and the spit and every other horrible thing that could ever be uttered. That shame and guilt that was put onto his head, those times a million when we think about what happened in Auschwitz, it was all laid on him. And it was all laid so that you might come back and understand that whatever shame that you may be feeling today that has been exposed in your life because of your decisions or what someone has done to you can be broken this morning because of what Jesus did when he passed the test in the garden for you. And when we sang hallelujah, all I have is Christ, that's all you have. That's all you have. That's all I have. We're going to finish here, and I, I put a few more verses in the bulletin, but we're not going to get to them. And all I can say is that when it comes to struggling through temptation, the kind of which comes from the devil that's combined with what entices you 
and perhaps what has become your only thing, whether it be food, beauty, the pride of intellect, whatever it is, that th- there is this incredible, there's this incredible thing that God has done for his people. He's, he's, he's given them a help, a helper. And again, <laughs> when Adam received Eve as a helper, it's a prefiguring to the fact that he will give his people a helper one day in the Holy Spirit who will bring to mind and cause to remembrance all the words that had been spoken by him to all of us. God continues to meet every single need by his word. And when Jesus went through his own temptation at the hands of the devil, what do you think he did? He went right back to the word of God and quoted it exactly because it had power. And it's that power that we need by the helper who is the Holy Spirit to resist the devil so he will flee from us. To not give him too much credit to make sure that we take care of the responsibility that is ours, but to take him seriously. Because even though he's a defeated foe, he is an enemy who seeks our destruction because he wants us to swallow the lie that there is something outside of God's command that you think might liberate you. He wants you to believe that. And he wants you to think that you can find it and that it will be your happiness, but it will never be. And it will ultimately lead to your destruction. In World War II, there was this thing called the resistance. Small groups of people who were found later by the Allies, who gave intelligence and comfort and aid and warmth and shelter and food to the Allies so they might defeat the enemy. And in a way, we are part of that resistance. That there is an ally who has fought the fight for us, but we still live in the midst of skirmishes. Battles won, battles lost. The ultimate one has been won. But for his people now, we still have a responsibility to stand against the devil and his lies. And it's my hope this morning that wherever you are in the midst of your own resistance, that you will be able to sing hallelujah, all I have is Christ, and that you will hold on to him more tightly today than you did yesterday. Let me pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the truth that we've read in your word, and we ask now as we go from this place that you will help us, that you will minister to to all of our needs, and that you will give us hope in the midst of whatever circumstances we may face when it comes to the temptation of falling into sin. In Jesus' name, amen.